Pep R. This is a series that actually is uh, coming out of a broader pro project we have at Georgetown um, called Global Political Economy Project, GPEP. It's a new initiative based at Georgetown run by myself and Professor Abe Newman, um, where we're seeking to recast the study of political economy, particularly thinking through how globalization has transformed the world around us, the politics of that world, and all the different uh, ways in which uh, everyday lives uh, of all of us are being transformed in that. Um, it is supported by the Open Society Foundation's Economic Justice Program. So today's event, we're very, very excited to have with us Alexandra Geisinger. Alexandra is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Temple University. Her scholarship broadly considers domestic and international reactions to countries' trade, capital, and exchange rate policies, so at the heart of international political economy. Her current research on public opinion and foreign policy focuses on how and when voters form opinions and when those opinions matter. In her book, American Opinion on Trade, which was published in 2017, she identifies previously overlooked sources of protectionist sentiment, such as gender and race-based employment concerns and race-based ideas about which groups deserve redistribution. Um, Dr. Geisinger will present for about 20 minutes. I'll follow up with a few questions and then we'll open up to the audience Q&A for about 30 minutes. The Q&A today will be through our Q&A function, uh, the Zoom function at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please submit questions there throughout the event. You can go ahead and start uh, right now, in fact. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. So I'll go ahead and turn things over to Alexandra, who's going to, I believe, uh, share some uh, slides with us uh, right away. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to share some of my research and then also discuss way, perhaps what directions we can go um, in the future. So uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, as Professor McNamara said, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the, my last book, American Opinion on Trade, um, which generally talks about what shapes individuals' beliefs about trade and how um, and when, if at all, do these beliefs matter. And I'm going to focus on uh, the, the components to, that are linked to uh, issues of race today. So if I can get my slide to show up, there we go. So the, one of the first questions we might ask is why think about race and trade? When I started on this project, it was a question I got a lot of uh, questions about. And I want to make two sort of starting observations about trade policy that I'll provide some more uh, backup uh, support for. One is that like many foreign policies, trade is a distant issue for many Americans. What do I mean by that? Yes, there are definitely people who feel themselves affected by trade uh, because they're an employee employment, uh, which is uh, affected by imports, um, and then there are even fewer who actually recognize that they're in trade, uh, their employment that's affected by exports. Uh, but for uh, many, many Americans, this is not something that they uh, sort of think about as a daily basis as affecting themselves. Even if they're buying products off the shelves that are from, uh, from uh, foreign countries, it's not something that uh, they feel personally affected by, um, which allows for a lot of uh, open in their opinions and allows for cues from other situations uh, to influence the, uh, their beliefs. And one of the second sort of observation I want to make, and I'll provide some evidence for, is depictions in the media, and by this I mean both in news media and also in campaign media, often include racial cues, even if we don't directly see them. But though I do think recently we have seen them more directly, and I'll talk about that too. Uh, two results from my research that I want to focus on today is again that this public opinion is influenced by these racial cues. Um, and second, that you know, we might want to think about in the long term, one of the issues is, is when we have public opinion focused on these cues, we might actually miss other important redistribution effects that are going to weigh more heavily on non-whites. So that's kind of the trajectory of my talk uh, today. 
So I told you that trade is a distant issue for Americans. So I want to provide a little bit of support for that. And this is from surveys I ran in 2008 and 2012, asking American how trade affected their own employment. And as you can see on this chart, uh, there are two sets of gray, right? There's uh, some light gray in which the people who think that trade benefits themselves is actually fairly small, about 11% of people who recognize that trade benefits uh, their employment. And then there's a larger group in the darker gray, about 22% um, who think that trade um, uh, uh, hurts them, but about 70% of people actually don't feel personally affected by trade or don't know how trade impacts their uh, their employment. Um, yet we can also see that Americans do believe that trade affects other people's employment very strongly. So uh, not only are they less likely to say they're unsure about other people's, the effect of trade on other people's employment, but it's also overwhelmingly negative. And so we want to think a bit about how people have formed these beliefs and what kind of cues and context they're uh, taking to form these beliefs. Because usually we want to project our own outcome. We think something's good for us. We think it's good for other people. And here's a, a situation where we have people's beliefs about what's happening to other people influence their own uh, beliefs about whether trade is good or bad um, for the country. And the other thing is who's going to be depicted, how our trading relations are going to be depicted is really really going to matter then if there's a lot of uncertainty about themselves, but you know, they're trying to gather information to understand how it's affecting the country. So one of the things that I'm sort of interested in in my book is how campaigns in the news uh, media disproportionately discuss Chinese trade. Now, I'm not going to claim that Chinese trade and the entrance of China into uh, the WTO hasn't dramatically shifted uh, patterns of trade uh, in this country and around the world. However, it's also true that our main trading partner to Canada um, has been our main trading partner up until very recently. Um, and and yet that is not really discussed. Um in the media. And those are definitely not the pictures. We don't see Canadian workers in our pictures. When campaigns want to talk about trade and its effect, we're not looking at pictures of basically white Canadians. We're looking at the other, you know, generally a, a factory uh, where workers are, you know, all uniform, some type of, you know, some, some, this one's explicitly about China. Sometimes they're not explicitly, they're just Asian. And so we definitely have in the news media um, and in campaign ads, uh, this focus on China and Asia as the place where our jobs are going. And I found it really interesting when uh, Trump was promoting his steel tariffs as a security measure against China. Um, you know, these steel tariffs were, if you asked most Americans, I did, you know, they thought that the steel tariffs that Trump imposed were going to stop Chinese steel. And actually, top U.S. Um, suppliers at the time were Canada, Brazil, South Korea, Mexico, and Russia, right? Not China. Yet, we choose to depict this, both, you know, Trump and also the media kind of followed along as a security measure against China. And my research shows those types of depictions really matter. So, again, a survey I did when Canada was the U.S. main trading partner. 60% um, of people still thought it was China, even though our trade, you know, at the time, our, tr our trade with uh, uh, Canada far outpaced our trade with uh, China. And uh, perhaps more interestingly is just correcting people about the fact that our trade, our, our top partner was actually Canada, actually decreased people's support for trade protection. So I would argue that a lot of uh, support for trade protection is actually premised on this Asian depiction of trade as hurting our economy and particularly the depiction of China. So this is one of the sort of issues where I see race interacting um, as a daily kind of basis in changing people's perception about trade policy. And again, it's this media's focus on China and also um, particularly campaigns focus on China.
Um, the other question that I find fascinating is who do we think that trade protection is protecting, right? Trade protection is an interesting policy and it has built in this idea that we're protecting and economists don't like that and could give you lots of arguments about why they think that's a wrong term, but it is built in, it's the word we use. And so then the question would be who's being protected. Um, in 2016, uh, we saw a fairly explicit rhetoric that trade protection was going to protect the white working class and particularly men. This is a picture from a Politico uh, new news article all about white working men in the Midwest. Um, but what I was arguing much earlier than the 2016 campaign and what I had to sort of prove to people is that this is nothing new. This depiction of uh, trade protection as helping white male workers is actually something that's been going on a lot. So earlier in my work, I wanted to kind of think about who the face of trade protection was, who we think we're protecting when we protect uh, when we protect people from trade. And to do that, I uh, looked at way too many ads and I had my research assistants look at too many ads. And so I got found 385, basically all trade related ads from a wonderful archive at the University of Wisconsin um, that uh, has congressional, gubernatorial and presidential uh, television ads um, between 2000 and 2008. And then I added to that um, 146 identified trade related related ads from Public uh, Citizen to give me data from 2012. Uh, and I used two independent coders who had to go through these pictures and they discovered that this man, this man is the face of trade protection. Uh, and, you know, to give you some more sort of data other than that guy, um, in general, there was a, a white to black worker ratio of about nine to one over, they switched a little bit in 2008. Um, and what's sort of also interesting is in uh, depending on the campaign year, about 65, uh, 55 to 68% of ads were white only. There were no workers that were not, the Maya coders did not identify as white uh, in the pictures. So we have a really strong depiction of when we put in, when we put in protection, um, it's going to help this type of worker. Um, I could also go a little bit into the types of industries that are chosen. Uh, the types of industries also tend to be industries uh, which disproportionately hire wor uh, white workers. So both kind of the depiction of the workers and also the industries typically steel are shown tend to um, have a disproportionate number of white workers. So one of the questions people often have is fine, you did this coding, right? You showed, you showed me convincingly that this, um, it is, uh, they tends to, to show um, white workers. Why would that matter, right? They're majority um, of whites, there are lots of in the ads, that's very standard. And I think the important thing to think about, again, is that trade is a redistributive uh, policy. When we put in trade protection, it benefits some people's jobs over other people's jobs. And so it's a form of government redistribution. We have other types of redistributive policies, namely welfare, um, and those types of redistributive policies have uh, been depicted primarily in recent years as benefiting non-whites. Uh, and so we have a real difference here in two different redistributive policies and who's shown on the screen as benefiting. So I wanted to, sorry, this is the broader, I forgot, this is the broader picture of all the people that that man was in. This is a, from a Sal Pace for Congress. It's talking, as is interesting to my prior point, it's talking about how these men were denied a steel contract that went instead to China uh, and built a bridge in Colorado with Chinese steel instead of steel from these people. Um, so well, the question I had is, does this matter? We know from the welfare literature, it really matters who's presented as benefiting from uh, welfare and the switch of showing Appalachian whites as benefiting from welfare to showing uh, what was sort of you know, at the time was sort of welfare queens, urban welfare queens, uh, African-American women um, really switched uh, whites a support for welfare. And I wanted to see if similarly this presentation of white workers um, in trade protection ads was also influencing people's support for 
trade protection. And so in an experiment that I ran in 2014, it's, it was sort of a simple survey experiment where I created a newspaper, ad, a newspaper article. In that newspaper article, I talked about um, trade in um, shutting down a factory and leading to increased unemployment. Um, but I changed the depiction of who was affected. In one uh, control version, I had no workers in the text, and I also just showed a factory. So it was just about how trade had closed down this factory. Uh, in a second condition, I uh, showed a picture of two uh, African American, or at least people, th people that were uh, coded as African American um, by uh, multiple people in um, in an unemployment line, and I also used a sort of statistically significant name that people recognize as being an African American name in general, um, Cedric Washington. And in the other condition, I showed white workers in an unemployment uh, line with a more stereotypical white name again that was chosen off of. Uh, uh, economists produce these lists of um, Randy Snyder. And uh, one of the things that I found in doing my research is when you showed the um, when you when you showed the African Americans versus the whites, um, we actually saw increase in people opposing uh, new trade uh, restrictions. So they were less they were more likely to oppose trade protection when um, black faces were shown um, than when white faces were shown, and also they were less likely to support new trade uh, restrictions when black faces were shown rather than white faces were shown. And so that actually it created a gulf, right? It created a real change in support for trade protection. And again, to kind of come back to this issue about why this might matter, we can see real different white support for redistribution via trade and then redistribution via welfare. And this was the point I was trying to make earlier, that we've seen American whites you know, increasingly not support our welfare because, again, it's increasingly depicted as going to non-whites. Um, and um, yet with a, a second type of redistribution and trade protection, uh, we see actually far more support for this. And so I argue that this depiction of who this policy is benefiting and you know, who trade protection protects uh, is really important for understanding um, white Americans' opinions about trade policy. So uh, to sort of move back to the more general question about why should we, you know, why should we think about this problem of race in trade policy? I think that, um, you know, I want to make two general points that I'm happy to talk about more. Uh, we know that Americans are uh, more, more anti-trade than many other similar OECD countries. Uh, and I think one of the interesting things that we have in the U.S. is the focus on China, or previously to China, it was Japan, as our trading partners and as a threat to the U.S. Um, through trade. So trade is very much um, kind of depicted as um, threatening and particularly with these non-white countries countries, right, not Canada. And I think that skews perceptions of trade in general uh, and makes Americans more negative um, in general than they would be without these types of racialized depictions of our trading partners. I think for domestic politics, it's also important for reasons that some of which I've just talked about. One, it changes the choice of policies to deal with economic volatility. It's unquestioned that trade increases economic volatility, right? We like trade because it should increase our um, efficiency. It should allow us more opportunities for growth, but it also introduces more economic volatility. How do we deal with that? That was a really interesting question. We could increase trade. We could increase trade protection, and that's what uh, President Trump has been promoting. Um, but again, it shows that sort of is uh, very those types of uh, policies tend to skew towards very particular industries, industries that hire more whites in general, and also it's popular, I would argue, because of it's seen as protecting certain groups of people. <laughs> 
Whereas there are other types of policies that might be spread more universally via welfare or a minimum wage requirement or a greater investment in education to make a more skilled workforce that could compete more broadly. Um, but those uh, tend to have uh, the sort of not so specifically oriented towards white faces. And I think some of our choices as to whether we see a minimum wage as being acceptable or welfare as being acceptable versus trade protection is, again, the faces that are put on those policies. Um, and the second part is, you know, so it changes which policies are available really for discussion, and it changes public support for those policies when they're put in place. I think the final point I want to make, um, which I don't explore enough in my book, and I think I should explore more, is um, I also don't want to say that it's only whites that are affected by trade. That's not true. Um, African Americans, and I would also argue in other work, women um, are much more vulnerable to these types of economic um, uh, volatility that's brought in by trade. And by this focus on white working men, we ignore real concerns that uh, these groups have to because of due to their economic vulnerability. And we ignore policies that might mitigate some of that volatility for them and make the globalized world a, a um, a place that they can thrive in. And so that would be my final point is, you know, if we know that um, just knowing that trade, uh, just knowing that you know, the trade protection uh, is maybe more supportive because of whites shouldn't ignore the fact that people are hurt by trade. And we want to think about more types of policies that actually would focus on those groups with vulnerabilities. Um, so I look forward to questions um, from Professor McNamara and also from the rest of you. Great, thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, really appreciate this presentation. Um, let me sort of start off by saying how wonderful your work is, because you know when I think about most people studying trade for the past several decades, you know international political economy has tended to think about trade in such a narrow way, right? Thinking about people's preferences about trade as mapped onto their sort of positions in the economy, right? So just taking straight from the kind of economic playbook, whether it's about factors, sectors, firms, uh, classes, et cetera, and then projecting from that onto sort of, well, this, this explains people's positions on trade, right? And what I think is so fantastic about your work is that it really brings, situates, right? Um, people as economic actors, but also as political actors, but also as social actors, right? Then in fact, we respond to messages about trade as you have, have beautifully shown in your experimental work, partly through this lens of identity and how we think about our own identities and how we think about other identities and race being, you know, something that you've, you've shown very clearly as to be, as being incredibly important. Um, so I would say that, you know, is, is so refreshing and, and so wonderful to see. Uh, but it does beg a bunch of questions, right? Um, so let me sort of start um, with uh, a question around your wonderful sort of depiction of trade as something that is actually redistributive, right? That we think about trade often, again, as some sort of, you know, policy out there in the international economy, but it turns out, of course, that involves, those policies involve winners and losers, right? And you talk about how, in fact, this question of who benefits from trade and how we perceive who benefits from trade will lot, matter a lot in terms of how we think about trade. And you obviously focus on race. But I'm curious about the degree to which this is sort of a historically specific finding or whether race is something that actually um, has permeated kind of the history of uh, the way people think about trade policy or can you imagine or hypothesize about sort of other periods in american history when other kinds of identities might be activated in terms of the way people think about the distributional effects of trade so it's a really interesting question um you know one of the issues is i think the most obvious time in which we have seen this is actually slavery and then post-slavery with the use of Mexican workers um, to support farm labor, right? Um, because uh, there, much of the American history has been, is, is especially in the South and in Texas as well, you know, we have seen exports that have been used, that, that are 
when we talk about the strength of Southern exports, um, particularly before the Civil War um, or post post um, independence to the Civil War, um, that is dependent on labor, right? And labor in the U.S. was very scarce. And one, and we know that there's a history of indentured servitude for the Europeans, right? Um, but then there's slavery for the non-Europeans. Uh, and you know, I what is sort of fascinating to me is the extent to which um, we used and we sort of, I believe, developed even stronger racial beliefs because of the need to control workers, right? And to control workers to work in crop fields. And we can even see kind of early immigration policies about which workers would be allowed, the ability to identify those workers as ones that should be returned to Mexico after they did, after they cleared the labor. We still, I think, see that in today's immigration policies of sort of different types of treatment for uh, workers who we need for crops and workers that we don't. And I think our strong kind of um, or the racialization of those jobs, um, because they're, it, we don't find white workers taking jobs in meat packing plants or uh, tobacco fields. That that is no longer the, that is work that uh, you know they'll say Americans won't take, but what they really mean is to be, you know, white Americans won't do that labor. And we have a tradition of using race to segregate you know segregate the types of people who will do that work. So I think that would be the other obvious time in our American history where we've racialized that. And again, those that work is for exports. So slightly different, it's not import competing and worried about that, it's about how do we compete in the global market and we do it by subjecting certain groups and limiting their other opportunities because we need them in the fields, right? And so we uh, put in types of constraints that make sure that we have easy access to cheap labor. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, what your answer really beautifully kind of demonstrates is the ways in which these type of biases around, around race and other identity markers can be used very successfully as political resources for motivated actors, right? In different, in different kinds of contexts and how we need to kind of think uh, both about perhaps the kind of, you know, in, intrinsic inherent kind of situation at work, but then also how these things are used by by political actors uh, to certain types of ends. And that maybe um, allows me to segue a little bit to questions about China and thinking through kind of what might we expect in terms of our relationship with China and how different political actors, you know, the two different um, presidential campaigns going on right now and so on uh, might be playing on these types of dynamics. And, you know, can we, think about and expect um, you know, increasing adversarial relationships with China and for some of your findings to, to come into play in the way we, we interact with China. So one of the things that uh, is a little bit disheartening is you can see, not just in today's election, but going back in campaigns, both Democrats and Republicans pretty much equally demonized China. And again, I'm not trying to say that there aren't people's jobs who were affected by that, but the um, the red screens that come across the campaign ads. Uh, there's, you know, one ad where I think of where they basically are suggesting that um, in the Chinese embassy they're like secretively, you know, working to destroy the Amer America. There's just a lot of, you know. Cons sort of what you know, if I wanted to make a conspiracy or a CIA movie, right, those campaign ads have that and they have them on both sides. And I think, you know, one of the things that's um, sort of I find disheartening is um, my research suggests that you're not going to lose at least, um, especially among American whites, you're not going to lose by saying bad things about China, right? That the, the, you know, having um, there, there are very few pro-trade ads to begin with, so that's you know, so that that in itself is unusual. So I'm not even saying, hey, you know, it would be interesting if one party had more pro-trade ads and one party didn't. When I tried to actually find pro-trade ads for my research, there's like one John McCain ad that I could find <laughs> that was run on television uh, on the internet in Spanish and wasn't broadcast widely, right? So I think kind of speaking to this point of like, you know, it's hard to find anyway. And then the negative, you know, pro-protection ads, both sides have a real anti-Chinese sentiment. 
And so they're not going to, and then, and that I can't say from my research that they're wrong to do that. If they want to mobilize voters, that works, um, which is, you know, I think concerning because again, it, it works in a circle, right? It works for some voters, it helps mobilize those voters, but it also skews the perception of people about what trade looks like in the global economy in general and the extent to which um, trade influences their house prices because of Canadian lumber or relationships with um, or construction prices because of um, goods, you know, goods coming from uh, Mexico. And so I think that's, um, I don't see an end to that because that's a successful strategy. And um, Jessica Weiss at um, Cornell has, ha um, has actually written quite a few interesting pieces about how that's distorting kind of people's perception of also Asian Americans in the country. Fantastic. And I'm going to sneak in one more question before we go to the Q&A, you know, which I think sort of follows on a little bit maybe from your last comments, which is, you know, your, your um, fascinating findings that presenting people with facts about, you know, who we actually trade with, and in fact, Canada is our biggest trading partner, does actually decrease support for trade protection. I found very, very interesting, right, because a lot of the kind of um, work we're seeing now is that sort of no matter what you tell people, you know, it doesn't matter, we're in this alternative universe where nobody's going to sort of listen to facts. So was that a surprising finding for you that in fact you would see a kind of robust reaction which shifted people's opinions about trade that facts did seem to matter? So sadly, facts seem to matter when I was running this. So this is a 2017 book. Some of the, those experiments were run between, two thousand. my first data was 2006 up to 2016, right? No, 16 didn't get in there, it was 2014. So one of the things that maybe is outside of the purview of this and race is um, facts seem to matter a lot less. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my more recent um, ones, I, I, I would actually expect that not to be as effective as it was. Um, there are times in which I've been able to run, you know, I, I tend to try to always run factual things, um, just with my research as false as possible as to, you know, you find find people on both sides or things like that. And uh, you know, my prior work and actually work with Georgetown professor, um, Elizabeth Saunders has found that, you know, we can provide information and in, in the past that worked. My more recent studies have shown that um, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to move people so much, um, which is disappointing. One thing I did recently run and I thought was really interesting, again, because of the negative perspective of China. Um, I, let me try to explain this in, uh, you know, during the Trump campaign, he clearly ran on, uh, on uh, putting tariffs on China, right? He talked about about 45% tariffs on China. China was brought up multiple times in his actually announcement speech. Almost no other Republican candidate spoke about trade at all. Um, and they definitely weren't giving specific policies where Trump actually spoke very specifically about these tariffs he was going to put on to China. And so when he went on his first trip to China, that would have been in October of 2017, I used that to run an experiment because I wanted to know what would happen, right? What would be the boost I thought at the time of him going through and following through, but actually he came back from this trip rather than saying, he'd gone into the trip saying, I'm going to go there, I'm going to negotiate, I'm going to put these tariffs on them. And he came back saying, hey, good news, um, they're going to bring us more investment. No tariffs, more investment. Now, obviously, you know, six months down the road, he's changed his mind, he's done different things. But in a very brief period in the fall of 2017, he came back and said, oh, look, they've given us investment. Our Chinese trading relationships are fantastic. And um, what I found was really, truly depressing. The Republicans, all of a sudden, who had been more protectionist, were like, oh, terrific, and became much less protectionist. So maybe, you know, if you like trade, that might be a good thing. But the Democrats, or all of a sudden, who'd been less protectionist, were all like, oh, that's bad, right? And they were more protectionist. So all I saw when I was running this experiment to see whether, you know, putting forward this policy and keeping his promises would be effective, all I saw were partisan effects. So I think a lot of this is going to be, you know, what party is saying what at what time at this moment, which for me is less interesting. I like thinking about the distributional consequences. I like thinking about these other issues. Um, 
And uh, it took away some of those things that I enjoy about my research <laughs> because I don't really enjoy the partisanship yeah. as an IR scholar. I don't really get into the U.S. partisanship issues as much as maybe mm -hmm. our, my American counterparts do. Yeah, well, I'm, we have a lot of questions, so I'll try to get through them, but I will, we'll, we'll, we'll start very, very briefly. Maybe you could just give a really brief answer to this. Todd Tucker says, what do you hypothesize would happen to trade messaging if we eliminated the electoral college, right? So it gets to this notion that um, perhaps the trade messaging is being skewed away from the sort of absolute gains from trade to the relative distributional effects uh, in this very kind of skewed way, which privileges a very, very small number of people in these swing states. So any reactions to that or just that uh, it might matter? Yeah. So, I mean, hi, um, thanks, Todd. For that. It's a really interesting question. I think, you know, it, it's, I think it's also interesting because it skews both ways. I mean, the one I would automatically think of as the electoral college helping is actually exports. And, uh, you know, our farming um, industry exports um, and is one of the strongest exporting, you know, it's about the strongest, one of the strongest exporting industries in our country and is um, one of the greatest competitors in the, in the global market. And I actually found fascinating the fact that um, Trump was able to carry those despite the fact that um, his policies threatened those electoral college votes, right? And some of that is again, I think due to this sort of racial, the, the ability for him to tie race um, to trade, I think mitigated some of those farming states' concerns um, about, you know, what the economic effect of tra a trade war would be on them. Um, in terms of the industry competing states like um, Florida or, or like like Ohio, right, and and Michigan or swing states, and also import competing states. Um, whether the Electoral College, I mean, they're also populist states, right, in Pennsylvania too. So I'm not sure Electoral College will be enough because those are also populist states. Now, whether having, um, changing our primary system so that California gets to move first, right, California being one of our primary exporting states, whether that would help, I think, you know, putting the focus on um, some of these other states that have different pre preferences on trade policy, get earlier primary spots, I think might be more more influential, um, but I think also Todd's in a position he could probably tell me otherwise. <laughs> That's right. Okay, maybe kind of following up on that, uh, Gordon McNeil says, have you found that Americans' trade opinions on trade are more malleable than their opinions on other issues when presented with new information? I mean, you said at the start that, look, you know, people are incredibly uninformed about trade. So is it your sense that actually these sort of racial racialized cues maybe have more impact than in other areas where they might have a more sort of immediate understanding of their economic situation. So the work I've done that's closest to that question has looked across different types of foreign policies. So again, uh, George Chan Professor and Elizabeth Saunders and I have an article in ISQ that looks at nine foreign policies, uh, everything from uh, cap and trade in the environment uh, to um, dealing with uh, conflict states. Um, and we did actually find that uh, trade was much more malleable. More people don't know and thus they were more willing to take cues. In that case, we have cues from different partisans and it was sort of fascinating. Again, this is early, right? So at that point, um, on a, uh, on a, on a, when trade was still not politicized um, and like a part, sorry, not, a part, not, not in a partisan way, it was political, but both Democrats and Republicans had sort of the same story on trade. Um, and uh, most Americans didn't were say they didn't know. We were able to find that yes, compared to those other eight policy areas, um, they were much more malleable on trade. Now, um, if I were to look at other, it was an interesting question to kind of look at other kind of distributional, redistributional uh, policies. Again, being an IR scholar, I've tended to go and kind of comparing against IR policy, other types of foreign policies. Um, but I think that would be really worthwhile to look at. Great. Um, we have a question from Lorena Kettle. 
We know that Trump is a populist and perpetuates white supremacy. How much of an effect does Trump rhetoric have an impact on the perceptions of race and trade? Do you think that is unnecessarily inflated, I guess, his impact, or do you think it's more of an individual issue? So how much do those sort of cues that are coming from something like a Trump presidency matter in comparison to other things? So I think one of the things that's fascinated with me and I'd like to think a lot more about is the fact that he made it explicit, right? So I'd argue that trade and race were actually linked for a long time. And I was writing my book before and doing these studies before Trump appeared and he made the implicit explicit. And I've had to think a lot about what that means. I do think that having it linked at a, the racism in a party manner has maybe made Democrats in particular maybe see this and think a little bit differently about it. Now, I worry because I don't want them thinking that trade doesn't have redistributional effects that affect African Americans as well, right? So if they just start thinking that Trump is promoting trade just to help these whites, which you know, I think he is, right? But it, it doesn't take away the fact that other people, women and uh, minorities are also influenced. But I do think it's made, Trump making it more explicit, I think actually may have been helpful in making people think a little bit about it. I had a lot of pushback when I started writing on this topic. Um, you know, academics were like, there's no link, why are you saying this? And I had, I mean, I didn't show it all here. I had to like, you know, I have, you know, decades of analysis looking at people's opinions opinions from the AES and like where they live and diversity and where they live. I coded up all these ads to show kind of the presentation. Um, I, you know, did these survey experiments. Um, and I think, you know, for better or worse, like Trump just put it up right in front. <laughs> and so, um, but I do think that changes the dialogue about it and hopefully will help people see through a little bit and think more clearly about it. Um, you know, on the other hand, he's probably also accepted, you know, increased the acceptability of racism. Um, so I don't know what the net effect is um, there. Right. I think that's that sounds, you know, exactly right and sort of feeds into our overall discussions in political science around how much does the sort of articulation of the various erosions around our democratic system and our democratic values you know, how much of that is just what we used to call cheap talk or, you know, is it actually doing some work in terms of breaking those taboos and allowing people to um, come forward with views that, that, that might have been latent, that they might not have been comfortable expressing and so on, and then ultimately actions, right, that actually erode these things. Um, okay, so actually... Uh, again, back to Todd Tucker, uh, if I may, um, what do you make of the Mutz versus Morgan debate on whether to code anxiety about trade as being about racial identity versus so sociotropic economic concerns, which obviously is something that, you know, you've been sort of talking about, but that's a very explicit, and very, very interesting debate, right, between scholars who are arguing about, you know, whether we should really look to the economic circumstances voters are in, to understand some of these uh, attitudes or whether it can all be placed simply on uh, racism. So I wonder if you could weigh in on, on that um, debate. Uh, that's difficult um, because I think to some extent it gets, I think one of the things that we really need to move forward and I think is hard to move forward is again, kind of deconstructing sociotropism into who we count in that group that is about us, right? And I don't, I think, unfortunately, we don't necessarily have yet the um, capacity, we don't have the, I don't think we have the capacity to actually make that distinction. I mean, I think we should, um, but I think it's all right now, the measures we tend to use are kind of lumpy. Um, and so it's really hard to clearly parse out. And I think that that's not something that's a debate that there's a, a winning side on. I think that's a debate that shows that there just needs a lot more work done um, in actually parsing that out more is yeah. better. Sorry, is that I, a, I com <laughs> No, I completely agree with you. It's a fascinating debate, but I feel like, you know, and it's starting, it's starting a debate. It's not actually answering the debate. Um, so a question from Neil Bilvin, has there been much analysis using CGE models and si simulations to predict how trade policies and developments might affect various racial groups? And he very kindly in the, in the Q&A 
specified CGE models refers to computer, computable general equilibrium models. So I guess getting to the question of sort of how much can we really specify different racial groups, um, costs and benefits of different types of trade policies, looking at sort of more the material distributional consequences. No, I was actually having, well, not the CGE, I was actually having a, a conversation with a different co-author just the other day. Um, you know, we tend to be just, you know, the, the, we still get stuck in kind of these inequality discussions. Um, there's a really interesting new paper out um, by Thomas, oh, why am I forgetting his name? Thomas Taylor is it? and um, Wang Rogowski kind of looking at inequality, um, but it's, it's, they're looking at regional inequality and skill-based inequality in high school. And I, and I re look at that and I say, we need, we need gender in there because that's a, the, pa yeah, the paper I'm working with my co-author is why aren't we looking at the, the effects um, breaking by gender and I think also on race. I mean, you know, and I think one of the things that's also important for that is, you know, we could do it in the US, but we also know that this is important for other countries, the UK in particular, um, what they call BAM, um, instead of uh, minority groups. Um, that is another area where we could look to see kind of the differential effects. So I think that that's a fruitful direction. I can't think of anyone, um, and maybe I'm wrong, I can't think of anyone that's done it. And I think part of the issue too is trying to get the data. It's only recently that we've collected data that allow us to start making those calculations. Terrific. And that really sort of speaks to this notion that if markets are structured by social identities, then we need to capture the ways in which those social identities have different distributional impacts on, from things like trade and, and so on. Um, from Xiao Li, we have how much does comparative advantage in trade play into the racialized Asian focused narrative of trade losses? namely because China's comparative advantage used to be in lower end labor intensive manufacturing, which is the sectors where white Americans manufacturing jobs are lost. It also becomes an apparent target for the type of population politicians are aiming their rhetoric at. So as China moves up the kind of um, uh, comparative advantage ladder, you know, are we likely to sort of see different types of racial messaging about China? And have yeah, you seen that? It's an interesting question. Um, you know, I remember when I was a long time ago, when I was in college, right, the big issue was kind of when British foreign aid was, or not foreign aid, when British investment um, was getting replaced by Japanese investment, right? And the big one was the Rockefeller Center. I don't know if anyone else remembers, but it was a big deal that the Rockefeller Center might be, be sold to um, Japan, you know, Japanese investors, and, but they'd been, it'd been helped by British investors and no one had blinked, right? And it was the same, it was just big money, you know, in either case. So I, I do think that the, the the rhetoric might change, but I think that that, unfortunately, I think that it is just that there is that racial difference, even when, you know, it was not, you know, at kind of the product level, it was just investment level, we still saw the threat of um, the sort of, you know, it being Japan. Um, I recently was contracted, or not contracted, contacted by uh, a firm that actually wanted me to do research on whether they should change the name of their group, um, their construction group, and they were worried that their name would be too Middle Eastern and that they wouldn't be able to get public benefits, you know, or they wouldn't win contracts in the South um, because of their name. And again, you know, it wasn't, I don't think it was so much that the workers, I mean, the, that were going to be, they were work, They had a firm that was going to be hiring American workers. Um, so it wasn't the particular losses. It was this idea that the name itself would make people fearful of um, contracting or doing it. So I, I, I take your point that some of it is, you know, who, who where the jobs are being lost um, and to whom. Uh, but I think that it's more widespread than just that explanation. Mm -hmm. And your, you know, potential to make some money um, kind of points to how representations matter, right? These words and images and narr narratives, actually, they do work in the world, both in terms of sort of markets and making money, but in terms of politics as well. 
And I have my uh, co-leader, Abe Newman, who would like to uh, ask a question, actually. And I don't know, uh, Abe, are you going to unmute yourself? I can just unmute yes, myself. there you are. I'm going to be the floating voice of oddness in this conversation. Um, uh, first of all, thanks again, Alexander, for a great talk and such an amazing uh, set of questions and topics to, to talk about. Um, I was going to maybe ask you to comment on two different themes that I think are related to your work. One of them is about um, kind of, well, I'll just put under the banner of racism in the left. And what I'm thinking of here is that, you know, many of your pictures that you're putting up are what we would usually associate with union workers or union organized um, jobs that were traditionally, you know, held by white uh, male workers. And so kind of just thinking about, you know, how does this conversation that you're having intersect with the role that um, left-oriented institutions also uh, play? Because I think a lot of people are, you know, picking up on the Trump and China and those things, but I think that some of what you're, you're identifying are these frames and how they're in many different places in society. Um, and then the second point I wanted to just maybe see if you had any thoughts about are on the, the way race intersects with the community effects of trade. So a lot of research focuses on individuals, how are you, you know, is your job an import or export job? Um, but I think more recent work has really been showing how the consequences of trade don't just affect the workers, the, you know, the actual workers who are affected, but the communities and how those communities decline and how that could be, you know, thinking about racial disparities in those communities. So I'm, I'm thinking about kind of some of um, Adam Dean's recent work about military recruitment or opioid epidemics in these communities that have been affected by trade. And I'm just wondering if there's work out there about racial inequality uh, or disparities that also happen in that similar pattern. As uh, so let me, so I think that the racism in the left and particularly in the unions um, is you know, a fascinating question. And I think, you know, also due to some of the early restrictions on who could be, you know, who the unions would allow in, um, you know, led to, we see kind of a bifurcation of where we see more white workers and more non-white workers. And you know, one of the fascinating things that I, in reading my book, was talking about the service unions and how the service unions tried to break off. And um, they did make their own union that hasn't really been as successful as I think that they wanted to. And one of the main platforms of that service union was that they didn't want to take an, they didn't want a protectionist stance. And that service union is uh, far more more uh, non-white than sort of the traditional ACLU, um, CIO type, um, yeah, the unions under that, that, that framework. Um, and it was odd to see as trade as a primary platform, and they could do it, you know, in part just for the traditional reasons of the ACLU, uh, CIO has to have, it has both import competing and export oriented industries, you know, represented in there. So sometimes it can be tricky for them to take a, a direct stance on trade, whereas the service unions can, because it's primarily services um, that are not um, competing, but also that we get a different set of types of workers in terms of race uh, distribution in those two unions. And so I think that there's, but that's not a voice you hear very often, right? Um, and so I think that even though service workers are now increasingly part of our economies, um, and again, probably represent more non-white workers than the traditional uh, unions, uh, that um, they don't historically have the power, they don't get listened to, you know, who's, you know, who do the news reporters call? It's generally not them. Um, so I think that their voice is being being minimized on a lot of these issues um, and probably not allowing that representation to really influence policy as strongly as it possibly could. And again, the left probably has something to do with that. Here's a union that you don't hear so much, isn't being brought out on stage during conventions or things like that. Um, in terms of the race and um, community effects on trade, you know, I, 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 you said Adam Dean. I would have just said she, I would have punted and said you should, you should read work by Adam Dean um, on that. Um, I'm not going to have a good answer to that. Um, he would have a better answer uh, to that. I can't think of, I can't think of anything that I could obviously um, talk about um, for that. You know, one of the things that I, I do, one of the things in my book. 
which is um, sort of, I find, a little bit sad, is the more diverse the uh, communities are, the stronger I find the effect of white support for trade protection is. So that, you know, where you have a, a, a community that's more diverse, um, that that exponential importance of having that white face on the trade protection becomes more and more important. Um, and I think that's that suggests that those communities, even as the diversity increases, we still see really strong divisions and you know who we count as us um, and how we're going to try, what policies we're going to support because they support us versus them um, are not just are not don't don't dissipate as we see uh, greater mixing in a community. Excellent. Okay, we're coming to the end of our hour. Um, thank you very, very much, everyone who's uh, submitted questions. I guess just one more sort of uh, thing I wanted to throw out is, you know, thinking about the kind of broader trajectory of, of trade in the United States that, you know, we had, you know, the opening up to global markets in the embedded liberalism way, sort of in the, in the post-war era where trade was something that was, you know, still relatively framed through kind of democratic mechanisms and a, a sense that it, it should be limited and should uh, coincide with social stability and political stability. And then, you know, in the 1990s and onwards, you see trade kind of move out of democratic politics to the point where you have the WTO, you have free trade agreements, you have a whole kind of more neoliberal trade ag agenda that to some degree kind of drifts away, I would argue, from a kind of focus on democratic mechanisms that might allow for kind of trade to be situated within broader goals, you know, social stability, economic goals, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we might, I mean, I'm curious as to, and we're totally out of time, so this is completely unfair, but, you know, some of the sort of stuff that you're seeing, it strikes me, one can think about the complex interaction of that sort of, you know, those changes in sort of neoliberal uh, economic um, programs and the rise of these more, kind of racialized understandings of, of these interactions. So I'm not even gonna let you respond to that tragically. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, let me say uh, thank you so much to Alexandra. Really, this has been such a delight. There will be a recording of this event on the Mortara website, on the GPEP website, lives inside the Mortara website. Please check that out. The next talk in our series will be two weeks from now, Thursday, August, October 15th at noon. We'll have Robbie Shillman of Johns Hopkins, and he's going to talk about race, colonialism, and the global economy. So please go ahead and RSVP for that on the GPEP website to get the Zoom link. And uh, with that, I will wish everyone an, a wonderful day. And thank you very, very much to everyone for coming and participating, and absolutely most of all to Alexandra for all of her wonderful insights. Thank, thank you for you. inviting me. It was really fun. <laughs>